Big Mood, Little Mood is brought to you by Progressive. Most of you aren't just listening to a podcast right now. In fact, the idea of someone just sitting down on a couch doing nothing else but listening to a podcast sounds terrifying, like on par with when Wendy finds Jack Torrance typing over and over again, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. It would strike fear into my heart if you just sat and listened to a podcast without doing anything else. Please don't do that. It would upset me. You're probably driving or cleaning or even exercising while you do this. But what if you could also be saving money by switching to Progressive? Drivers who save by switching save nearly $700 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Multitask right now and get a quote today at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $698 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Discounts are not available in all states and situations. Hey there, Big Mood, Little Mood listeners. Before we get started, I want to let you know about a story that's coming up a little later in the show. It's from our partners at Macy's. Since 2021, they've partnered with UNCF to provide scholarships to nearly 300 students at historically black colleges and universities because a mind is a terrible thing to waste and a wonderful thing to invest in. And all this month, you can support UNCF by rounding up your Macy's purchase in-store or donating online. Stick around to hear from Calvin, a Macy's Brighter Futures Scholar at Morehouse College. Just a reminder that Big Mood, Little Mood with Daniel M. Lavery happens twice a week. Slate Plus members get an additional mini episode or Little Big Mood every Friday. Sign up now to listen at slate.com slash mood. Welcome back to Big Mood, Little Mood. I am your host, Danny M. Lavery. And before I introduce my guest today, I'm very excited about this. I just want to let you know that this may be a first in Big Mood, Little Mood history. My guest today is a former letter writer. And for those of you who are interested in hearing their letter before you listen to today's show, I can tell you that it's in episode 54, which we published on May 18th back in 2022. And the letter itself is nonprofit nonsense. I highly encourage you to go back and listen to that episode. It's a real doozy. I encouraged the letter writer to quit their job. And if you would like to find out whether or not Sunshine did, in fact, quit that job, you're going to have to listen to the end of the episode because I like to withhold information from you. With that out of the way, my guest today is Sunshine, a Black trans mask immigrant from Sao Paulo, Brazil, currently living in Durham, North Carolina. They're the digital content producer for the National Birth Equity Collaborative, an organization that fights for the maternal, infant, sexual, and reproductive well-being of Black people. Sunshine, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. I'm so excited for you to be here. I feel like there's a sort of interesting theme this week that we don't always get to tackle that has to do with dealing with other people's relationship to optimism, complaining, venting, conversations with friends. And it feels really interesting and kind of meaningful to think about what are good ways to advise people uh, to both be open-minded and also to push for change or, or change their friendships if they want to. I agree. Yeah, they're super interesting. I think that especially at the current time that we're living, I think it's it's just like pessimism, optimism. Everything is just like such a delicate, like there's a delicate balance to achieve. So I'm excited to get into it. Yeah, yeah, I am too. Well, then I think we should just get right into it. And I will go ahead and read our first letter if that sounds all right to you. Sounds great. So the subject of this letter is good grief. A friend of mine is grieving very deeply. She's in so much pain that she is lashing out at everyone in her life. Many of her comments project her own insecurities and frustrations with her life and people in it, which I try to let go due to her situation. However, it's unbearable. She is so negative all the time and wants most of the attention focused on her to talk about her grief. I want to be there for her but she has no capacity or interest in listening to anything about my problems or my life. 
yet complains to me that I don't share anything with her anymore. Anything that I do share, she judges. She lectures me about how I need to be more like her because she thinks, and tells everyone so, that she is more emotionally intelligent than most. If she was really emotionally intelligent, she would try to understand others' point of view and behaviors rather than making assumptions. I know that grief is very hard, and we all process these emotions very differently. There's no timetable for difficult emotions to pass, but how do I support my friend now when it's very difficult to be around her? This one was, of course, quite sad. Did you, reading this, get a sense that this seemed like the friend had somewhat been like this and then grief kind of made it worse? Or their relationship used to be pretty solid, then they suffered a serious loss, and now all of this has kind of appeared for the first time? You know, that was actually my main question in this letter. I was curious about how long this has been going on for. So I 100% agree. There's no timetable for difficult emotions to pass. Grief is an ongoing process. It is not linear. There's no time frame that is appropriate for somebody to be going through something like that. And I'm also curious about like, how long has this been going on for? Because at the beginning of the letter, I got the impression that, okay, this is like something new. This is coming up literally out of like this grieving period. Like that's when this started coming up. But then we reach the end of the letter and then they say, if she was really emotionally intelligent, she would try to understand others' points of view and behaviors rather than making assumptions. And then that feels like an all-encompassing judgment of that friend as a whole. And that gives me the impression that some resentment had been there from before this grief period. Yeah, I got that read too, that there was definitely a serious change, but that maybe some of the judgment was present earlier and it just, maybe the letter writer didn't notice it as much or because it was interspersed with other forms of optimism or give and take or understanding, it it didn't pose the same problem that it has lately. Uh, Do you think that you would have really different advice if this was, say, six weeks into a bereavement versus six months or a year? Honestly, yeah, I definitely think so. Because I feel like if this had been like six weeks, five weeks, less than that, then I'm like, honestly, try to stick it out a little bit longer, feel out how things are, really evaluate whether these are behaviors that had been there prior to this grief period. And I'm not getting in this letter a good sense of like what you enjoy about this friendship and like what had been there from the beginning and like what's binding you together from before you had to support this friend in this grief period. So let's say like if we take the route of like, okay, like they had a really solid friendship before. It's like really great, lit, whatever. And then this happens and it's been six weeks give it a little bit more time. It it would just be nice for you to give it a little bit more time. But if it's been a longer period of time, maybe one year, two years, then I start getting into like a territory of like, okay, like honestly, like how good of a friend can you even be to this person if you're so resentful and having such a hard time being around them in the first place for such a long time? I think that's a really important question. Yeah, my sense was... Actually, I don't know that I have a strong sense. It really could, I could imagine this at six weeks. I could imagine this at at six months or a year. I don't think I'm prepared to hazard a guess. So I think maybe what I think would be most useful for me to start with as I think about how I would want to advise this letter writer is, I think maybe the most useful thing would be to consider, are there ways that you can talk to your friend about this behavior that don't necessarily involve getting into bringing up her grief. Because if what you want is for her not to lecture you or not to judge something that you've just shared with her, I think just saying, you know, gently, kindly, respectfully, I'm not looking for advice right now, or I feel like what you said was really judgmental and I'd like you to just listen. Um, You can say those things in their own right without bringing up her grief. And and I think that might be more effective because my guess is if you just say, I really wish you wouldn't do that, you stand a better chance of her hearing you out than if you say, I really wish you wouldn't do that. And I think you've been doing this a lot more since you started grieving this loss. 
because then then all of a sudden she has to kind of defend her her grief and i think that would just be too painful and and frankly even even if you do see a really clear pattern you don't necessarily need to bring that up in order to ask her to stop does that seem reasonable to you or does that seem like avoiding the issue No, I think that's very reasonable. I think especially if it's been a while that's that's been going on for, then I do think that it it does move a little bit beyond something that is temporary, right? Like, because like at the end of the day, you're not going to just suddenly stop grieving. So we can make this about the friendship as a whole as time goes on. Yeah. And I think separating the issue of sometimes she's really judgmental, uh, sometimes she lectures you, Um, If you can separate that from the other stuff that involves, I think, really more directly connected things, like she's a lot more negative than she used to be and she wants to talk a lot about her grief, those two things to me feel really understandable. Like, well, yeah, she's just been bereaved. That's to be expected. And that's probably going to continue for some time. But I think if you are able to address some of the other issues that have been bothering you, you'll have more patience for the things that are not going to be easy for her to fix. Like she can, even while she is grieving, catch herself if she's lecturing you once you've said, I don't like that, please stop. But saying, you know, trying to intervene on those other points, I think would be too big of a task for either of you right now. So um, I would encourage you just to gently say to her, either the next time she does it, or if you feel up for it, just saying, Hey, I know you mentioned earlier that you have noticed I don't share things with you as often anymore. And I want to be honest with you because I think you deserve honesty and and you were, you know, vulnerable with me about what you were feeling. I think lately the last few times I have tried to share something with you, you've gone pretty quickly into judging me or telling me exactly what I should do. And I really don't want you to do that. I would really like it if you would just listen. Um, and then, you know, I would like to start sharing things with you again um, and we can maybe find our way back to that way that we used to be. And even if her reaction to that in the moment isn't immediately, wow, thank you for telling me this. I feel so great. I'll do that right away. You know, you'll at least, I think, feel better that you've said something. And and I think maybe this is where we're getting into some of this letter writer's issue is this fear of, if my friend is grieving, I can't say anything to her ever for an indefinite period of time that would require her to change or try harder, or maybe even apologize about something. Like, she she just gets a free pass to do or say whatever. Because that will, of course, eventually lead to resentments, because that's not a good way to lead a, a friendship with anybody. And so I think it will help you to remember, you know, if somebody is grieving, no, you should not say, I really miss when you used to be more cheerful. I bet she does too. But if somebody is hurting you or doing something they shouldn't, you can still gently and with context say, please stop, this is not working, or please stop, this is hurting our friendship. That's not the same thing as like stop grieving. That's not being insensitive to her loss. That's not making unrealistic demands, like just get over it. And I think it's really important to separate those two things. I love that. I definitely agree. Yeah. I think my last note on it was like, have you had this conversation with them before? And yeah, have you tried to work it out? And Yeah, I just, I agree. And I get it. It is hard. People often don't want to say the wrong thing to someone who is grieving. So sometimes that can lead us down the path of saying almost nothing, which can be itself pretty alienating. And not that I would put this in the exact same category, but certainly, you know, uh, three years ago in like a pretty intense and painful way, I lost uh, my family. And I, I think in a lot of ways, despite my best efforts, it made me more difficult to be around for for a long time. And it and it was not just a linear sort of progression out where like, you know, six months out, I was doing much better than I had on day one. And a year later, I was doing much better than that day. And, and it's definitely been a process to sort of crawl my way back to a place where I feel like, yeah, I think I'm doing an okay job staying on top of listening to my friends or not complaining all the time or, you know, fill in the blank. And and so I think at least in that sense, it is hard and it sometimes takes a long time and sometimes like big grief or big loss kind of makes you harder to be around. I think that's true. And um, I really, really hope that you and your friend can have, you know, small scale conversations about the stuff that you hope she can fix in the short term 
so that you can still be present for the part of her that's like, and I'm still exhausted and angry and sad a lot of the time. Because that, hopefully, it sounds like you want to be there for her. It sounds like you're just hoping you can get some of these other things adjusted so that you can be her support in the big loss. And I think that's possible. And and you two will hopefully be able to get there. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, and just for anybody, again, even if they're grieving or not, if somebody's lecturing you and you want to say, please stop. I feel like you're lecturing me and I really don't want you to. That's okay. That's not rude. That's not mean. That's not bad. You can say that even if they're going through something painful. Yeah. I think I also really agree with what you said about like, in many ways, it is like honoring the friendship to be able to reach out to somebody and be like, hey, I know you're going through it. And I want to be able to acknowledge that. I want to be able to be there for you. And this is what's being difficult for me while I'm trying to be there for you. I think it's like, I appreciate it when people in my life call me in and Mm -hmm. try to work it out. That shows that we're really like in for this friendship for real. Right. I I think that's so important because it's really difficult sometimes to have a fight or a disagreement with a really close friend. But I know, at least for myself, I would so much rather a friend tell me, you've been doing something either lately or for a long time that really bothers me, even though I know in the moment I would feel upset, embarrassed, ashamed, a lot of, you know, bad feelings. I would so much rather that they shared it with me so we could try to work it out as opposed to just drift further and further away and then one day realize like, wow, I never talked to such and such person anymore. I wonder what happened. Yeah. Yeah. Or even them just ending the friendship without giving you a chance to address what was going wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's really, really usually worth doing. Obviously, there's exceptions to almost any situation, but I think where possible, if it's a longstanding friendship with someone you care about, it's worth at least trying to have one or two difficult conversations um, rather than just, I won't say anything. I can't say anything. Now I don't want to see them. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I think that's all I've got for this one, unless you have any sort of final thoughts for this letter writer or more generally anyone who's trying to be there for somebody who's grieving and the grief isn't, you know, fun. Yeah, no, I think my my the common thread in these letters, including this one, was just for me, it was like there's no perfect time for you to have a difficult conversation and Yes, like we can definitely like find a more appropriate time, especially if it's been like a really short period of time in which this person has been grieving for. Like there are appropriate moments for you to like bring stuff up, but like there's never going to be a perfect time when somebody's not going through anything for you to bring something up. Yeah. Yeah. Short of like probably if you're at a funeral, not a good time to criticize anybody. Obviously, like use some common sense about big special days or like the few days after something huge happening. But in the sort of like uh, middle stretches, not exactly a big momentous day itself of like grief or loss or change, you know, that can end up taking up big chunks of your life. People can go through a lot of life suffering recent loss or disruption. And if all of us had to observe total silence around conflicting desires or impulses or interests um, or asking people to change something during those times. You'd only have like a six week window every two or three years where you could like ask your friends to change and everyone would have to get it all done like right away. Like many people, I have mental health My number one recommendation for it is getting two dogs. If you can't get two dogs for any reason or already have two dogs, you could consider Headspace. The last few years have taught us all how important mental health is to our overall state of well-being. Headspace helps to improve mental health through guided meditations, mindfulness practices, breathing and calming exercises, and so much more. I accidentally went to a sound bath yesterday that lasted for an hour and a half. I don't often accidentally stumble upon impromptu sound baths, so I'm not sure I could recreate the experience without lots and lots of planning. It's nice to know there are alternatives. With customized, personalized approaches to help you navigate through all of life's moments, big and small. The wide range of teachers with diverse backgrounds and areas of expertise ensure that there's a teacher and content that can help you, whether you're a first-timer or have been practicing for years. 
Headspace has the world's largest library of content with over a thousand hours of clinically proven mental health exercises. Headspace has helped more than 100 million people worldwide, and they can help you too. Listen up, you do not want to miss this. For a limited time, all of you can try Headspace free for 30 days by going to headspace.com slash mood30d. That's mood30d. You won't find this offer anywhere else. Use the link H-E-A-D-S-P-A-C-E dot com slash mood30d to unlock all of Headspace free for 30 days. This is not something they normally do. Headspace.com slash mood30d. This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and Macy's. Hey, y'all, what's up? It's your girl, Lene Vini. I'm a writer, creator, and a change maker. And take it from me, when you set out to change the world, it really helps to know someone has your back. That's what Macy's is doing with UNCF, funding scholarships at historically Black colleges and universities so students like Calvin can thrive. I am Calvin Bell III, a junior at Morehouse College. I'm very passionate about the criminal justice system. As someone who knows firsthand through my father, he lost his life through the criminal justice system. It taught me to be a scholar activist and use my scholarship and research to learn how can I advocate for those who are incarcerated and behind bars. Being a Macy's UNCF Brighter Future Scholar has opened up even more doors for me. I'm looking towards grad school as well as law school to ultimately be able to be a public scholar, to teach classes around political theory, political philosophy, as well as carceral studies. When you are buying your suits, shirts, shoes at Macy's, you're doing something even bigger than that. You're reinvesting into the minds of students like myself. Now's the time to help more students like Calvin. All this month, when you round up your purchase at Macy's or donate online, you'll help fund UNCF scholarships for HBCU students across the country. Find out how Macy's is creating brighter futures for all at macy's.com slash purpose. I think that's all I've got on that one. Would you like to read our second letter? Sure. All right. Subject, ready to let go. I had a friend who went through a serious health crisis. During these difficult years, lots of old friends who had otherwise fallen out of touch came together to support her. But after getting to know them better, I see we don't have much in common. This group is pretty negative all of the time. I understand the circumstances have caused pain and grief for all of us, and everyone manages that in their own way. But I'm also wary of groups that bond over negativity and generally try to avoid it. Much of this group's bonding comes through posting regularly on Facebook, usually woe is me, the sky's falling type of stuff, seemingly relishing the sympathy likes and self-esteem boosting. I've tried to talk to them about the gossip to see why they do it. Vindictiveness, jealousy, anger, pain, desire to belong to something, and better understand their feelings to help their agitation. It seems they prefer this negative state. In recent years, I've tried to lessen my time with them, and since our friend has since passed away, there's really nothing connecting us anymore to where I want to discontinue those relationships. Is there anything I can do to maintain relationships with pessimistic people? I I feel for this letter writer much in the same way that I did for our first letter. It seemed a little bit more like a lot of this had to do with just Facebook connections, like that these were not friends the letter writer is spending a lot of time with either in person or talking over the phone or seeing very often. And so at least in that sense, I think there's some slightly more straightforward ways of dialing back on how much of the complaining the letter writer sees. Did that feel true for you or did it feel maybe more interesting or worthwhile to focus on the fact that these are old friendships of long standing and that have involved suffering the loss of a shared friend together? Honestly, this seemed pretty straightforward to me. Like I have very few notes on Mm -hmm. it because it does feel like these are not, I don't see a lot in this letter about these are the reasons why I loved these friendships and this is what I'd lose if I had to break them up. 
And if I had to distance myself from them, I don't see a lot of that. I do see a lot of like internet friendship, especially like the piece where it like gets into like gossip, Facebook, vindictiveness and stuff like that. Like it just like doesn't really seem to me there's not a lot on there in there that is like, all right, like y'all have a really strong foundation. Right. Yeah, I think especially because in the beginning of the letter, they even mention before my friend got sick, all of us had mostly fallen out of touch the first time around. So I I think it might be helpful to just think of this as this is a big disparate group of people who don't necessarily have a ton in common. We were able to come together and support our friend as she was dying. And that was meaningful and important. And now that she's gone, I am finding that I don't have a lot in common with them. And so I don't think that that means you should like denounce them or I'll block them on Facebook simultaneously. Like there's no reason to make this any more decisive or or painful than it needs to be. But absolutely, if you just feel like I don't get anything out of these friendships and I don't want to stay connected on social media, I don't want to look at what they're posting, by all means, you know, if you feel up to unfriending them, unfriend them. If you'd rather just mute them, mute them. Uh, whatever feels least conflict heavy and most easy for you to do. Uh, You can absolutely change your settings so that you never see any of their Facebook posts again. Agreed, agreed, agreed. That's kind of like why I had few notes on this because I'm kind of like, all right, like you do sound ready to let go. You seem pretty clear about what you like in people and what you don't like in people. And you've identified that these are not people you fuck with very much. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you can just let it go. I'm interested in that question and the way it's phrased. So like, is there anything I can do to maintain relationships with pessimistic people? Mm-hmm. And I'm just kind of like, wait, why do you want to? You just told us that you don't like that. Um, quoting, I am also wary of groups that bond over negativity and generally try to avoid it. Mm-hmm. So I'm just curious about that question. I I was too. Yeah. And I wondered if maybe the final question was a little bit more along the lines of, is there something I've not done that I should that would help me kind of, I I don't know, maybe honor my friend who died or uh, valuing maybe reasonableness within themselves and doesn't want to do anything in a hurry. But, you know, I, I think that's fine to say that you tend to be wary of groups that bond over negativity. I think that's a totally reasonable choice or preference. Um, it, it doesn't seem like the letter writer is saying, I only want to be friends with people who always see the cup as half full so much as I want to focus primarily on friendships with people who even when they go through something really difficult or they're suffering or they're experiencing oppression, their primary means of communicating with their friends isn't by naming all of the worst things that are happening over and over again. And I would maybe have different advice if I felt like the letter writer was just really impatient with sadness or suffering and needed things to always be sort of cheerful, even if it wasn't true. But I didn't get that vibe from them. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I definitely didn't. I feel like one question that I slightly had for like a second was like, are you constantly finding yourself being surrounded by pessimistic people. And that's what's prompting the question, like, how can I maintain relationships with pessimistic people? Because you have to. Mm -hmm. But it it doesn't really sound like that. It just sounds like, okay, like these are people that you don't really want to be friends with and you don't have to. So good for you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if anything, I think just looking over this again, this letter writer seems to me to be pretty careful in their approach to judgments um, and, and doesn't want to either let go of something too soon or dismiss somebody else out of hand. You know, you say, I understand that there's grief that we're all dealing with in different ways. I've tried having some conversations with them where I ask them, why are you doing this? Um, So, uh, you know, I I commend you, letter writer, for trying to ask and see if there was any way that you could influence them to do something else. And I think it's really reasonable at this point to say, well, I've tried that. Nobody seems very interested. And this is kind of driving me nuts. So uh, I would like to kind of let it go. I I say, go for it. Again, you don't have to tell everyone, I'm so sick of you. Uh, You can, you know, if if, if in a couple of years, somebody wants to like get a cup of coffee and reminisce about your friend who died and you decide you want to do that, it might be nice to have left the door open. But yeah, it sounds like 
the group kind of came together for a pretty extreme circumstance. Some of them are having a nice time being in a Facebook group where they vent a lot and you just don't like it and you should just go. Right, right. And, you know, it, it, my guess is you're right. It sounds like your reading of this is fairly accurate, but it's also possible there's more going on. And so I think you can just allow yourself to say, whatever they're getting out of it, I don't fully understand. It's not how I want to live my life. And, you know, good luck to them. I don't have to figure it out. I think it's probably a good attitude to take towards it because it may be that there's a lot of things that they feel are outside of their control. And this group is one place where they can reliably get attention and validation in ways that are maybe sometimes unhealthy and sometimes feel really good. And yeah, just again, you don't have to say this is the healthiest behavior in the world. You can just say, uh, you know, good luck with that. I'm going to do something else. Do you have any final thoughts about pessimism more generally? I realize we've mostly, I think, advised this letter writer, so we don't have to keep repeating what we've already said. But if if you have any more thoughts generally about, I don't know if you consider yourself uh, to be a more pessimistic or optimistic person, or if that's even a like a gradation that makes sense to you. I thought a little bit about that when I read this letter. I was like, damn, what am I? Um, But I feel like I'm kind of like in the middle. I'm like kind of accepting the state of affairs and trying to be mindful, cognizant, and like realistic about the oppression and the state of the world right now Mm -hmm. and what's going on. And at the same time, it's like, damn, I'm here for a short time and I, I'm going to try to make the best of it. Mm-hmm. Not like in a half, the cup is half full kind of way. But yeah, I think I think I, I, I like kind of in the middle. I don't know. But um, my advice, I guess, would just be like, have you tried having, I mean, this letter writer did name that they've tried to understand um, why they do it. And my only other note would be like, would it be helpful to more directly name, hey, I've noticed that y'all do this, pointing it out to them, bringing that to their attention, and then seeing what what happens from there. Yeah, it, it seems like in this particular instance, they've tried it and don't necessarily want to try it again. But I do like the idea of more generally for people in similar situations to approach that with sort of, sort of curious open-mindedness that can be really useful. It's so funny, as as you were saying, I found myself saying, yeah, I like to be in the middle too. And then I, I realized, when do I ever think I'm not in the middle? Like my first sense of myself is always, of course, I'm doing the reasonable thing. Um, and I'm not <laughs> yeah. always the best judge of like whether, you know, of course, you know, for me, it's like when I'm complaining or being gossipy in my head, I'm like, I'm just letting off a little steam. I'm so nice. I deserve this. Or like, well, this is an objectively difficult situation. So it makes sense to be negative. And then when I'm not doing that, then I feel like I'm the most reasonable person. I would never do too much of one thing or the other. And so anyways, this is all a very long-winded way of saying I'm not always the best judge of my own behavior. No, because you're so right because I'm on TikTok. That's what I'm always saying about myself. (laughs) Yeah, no, I'm on TikTok. I post on there a lot and it's so interesting. Like, I get a lot of comments being like, nah, you're too negative. Like, you're criticizing people too much. You're being too harsh. And I always think that's funny because I'm like, I'm just being real about like what white people are doing, what like, I don't know, like straight people are doing or whatever. And I don't think I'm being negative. And then in real life, like with my friends and my close circles, everybody's like, nah, like you're always partying. You're always like happy and like whatever. And I'm like, I, I don't know. I don't really know where I'm at. I mean, I think one thing about that that does sort of intuitively make sense to me is that I imagine real life interactions with people often like social, outgoing, friendly behavior gets rewarded in the moment. And on TikTok, saying something intense gets rewarded in the moment or saying something like with a really uh, like distinct point of view gets rewarded in the moment. So it might make more sense on TikTok to be saying something you feel most opinionated about. And then in person with your friends to go to a party, which is not to say that anyone can't get off track in either respects, just that like a video site algorithm is going to reward louder and louder or more and more vociferous opinions in ways that like going to a party really doesn't like. Yes. I, I, I'm sorry because now I feel like I'm supposed to say something like, and let that be a lesson to us all about social media. But sometimes I don't want to learn lessons about social media. I don't want to learn lessons about social media. I really don't. <laughs> I'm just, 
I'm going to do what feels good until it doesn't feel good. And then I won't. I I think that's actually a really great policy in life of like, sometimes there's room for venting or complaining or focusing on what's not working. And if it gets to a place where it feels like it's choking out everything else or getting in the way of your ability to exhibit curiosity in other people, you know, then that might be a good moment to say, is this still working? But it doesn't necessarily mean you should only do like perfect, beautiful, balanced, gallant things. You you can never be goofus. Like you should be able to be goofus at least 5% of the time, I think. Join Macy's on their mission to tackle barriers to education. Since 2021, they've partnered with UNCF to provide scholarships to nearly 300 students at historically black colleges and universities. Help Macy's and UNCF continue their impact by rounding up your purchase in-store or donating online this month to help fund scholarships for HBCU students. Learn more at macy's.com slash purpose. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, when you're listening, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something you can be doing right now. Getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy and you could save money by doing it right now from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $700 on average. And auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $698 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. Sunshine, if you're up for it, we have one more letter that is something that you and I are perhaps uniquely suited to uh, talk about a little bit. Are you up for it? Up for it, for sure. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Do you want to take this one or should I? I can take it. All right. Subject. Disclosure dilemma. I'm a gay trans man who has been mostly stealth at my job for five years. I have disclosed to a few people who were also queer or trans and seemed trustworthy. I have a cis gay coworker I've become friendly with over the past few years to the point where we now hang out socially outside of work. At some point, being trans came up and he said, you're cis, right? (laughs) I believe this was a well-intended but misguided question. I awkwardly said, uh, yup. Because I don't think anyone's entitled to know my status, and I honestly don't want him to know. He'd be enthusiastically supportive, but would probably bring it up all the time and tell me I'm brave. He's also made a big show of contrition when he used the wrong pronouns for a non-binary former co-worker. This happened a few times. But as we continue to become better friends, it's probably only a matter of time before he finds out or it otherwise becomes clear that I lied. And this feels like a big barrier to a real friendship. So what should I say when he does find out? Or should I get out in front of this and just tell him? How do I do that without making it sound like a big confession? Especially when I'm not sorry for not having told him sooner. I didn't mean to laugh. There's just something so incredibly uncomfortable about somebody asking you point blank. Yeah, you're a uh, you're sis, right? I have that highlighted. Yeah. I mean, that feels like such a a tricky question because it's like the fact that you're asking in this fashion means that you clearly have some sort of suspicion, but you're also asking it such a way that makes it pretty clear what the right answer is supposed to be. Um, And it just, yeah, really, you could not put someone more on the spot than your sis, right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what that was about. Just uncomfortable, I think. It, it sounds like the letter writer's coworker is like not a, a, a jerk or an asshole, 
but definitely uh, sometimes makes uncomfortable moments a little bit more uncomfortable um, and was maybe trying to fish for information at that point and didn't didn't feel didn't know how to do it. I mean, now that there's a great way to fish for somebody's status, right? Like it probably should have been an uncomfortable question because I don't want to advise anyone on like, here's an incredibly smooth way to ask if somebody's trans. Yeah, I feel like it's one of those things where it's like, honestly, if it feels that uncomfortable to say it, you should probably not say it. Yeah. And yet he went ahead and said it anyways, even without <laughs> our permission, which is so annoying. Um, I feel like when I read this, I was a little like, I mean, obviously, sometimes you can want to become close friends with someone who still has maybe some traits that you don't fully approve of or totally trust or you think, I do like you, but I think maybe you're too much of a gossip for me to get really vulnerable with you or be honest about some things, which I get. But I do also think if you keep getting closer to someone and also thinking, I really don't want to disclose to you, I don't want you to find out whether or not I'm trans, maybe the solution is stop getting so close. Like that's a, that is, that is a kind of difficult road to walk. And if you think it's kind of inevitable, he's going to find out and he's going to make it weird and you don't want him to make it weird. I think maybe keep things where you're at or, or even back off a little bit rather than get closer and closer. So maybe stop proposing you to hang out like every week after work. Um, and you know that doesn't mean you have to start ghosting him in the halls, but maybe you're reaching a limit of how close you would like to get with him. Yeah, I agree, especially because I was curious about the piece about like he'd be enthusiastically supportive, but would probably bring it up all the time and tell me I'm brave. He's also made a big show of contrition when he used the wrong pronouns for a non-binary former co-worker. And this happened a few times. So it just made me a little bit curious about like, OK, and you do want to get closer and closer to this person? Like, it's okay if, like, this person has, like, a, a lot of other awesome attributes and, like, mm -hmm. maybe I'm just, like, missing that. But it just, it did make me, like, you do name at the end again, like, I'm not sorry for not having told him sooner. I still don't really feel like telling him. It's the main driver for telling him would be I don't want to get found out and then it'd be awkward. So I'm just, like, a little bit, like, how close of a friendship do you want with this person? Yeah. Yeah. And I wondered if some of that was, I think sometimes some people, especially when it's a friendship that originated at work, feel like once you've reached a certain point of no return, like the the inertia of the friendship has been rolling forward long enough that like trying to stop it or slow it down would be too abrupt. And so I was wondering if maybe the letter writer felt like, well, maybe I don't want to be that close to him, but it's inevitable now because we've taken too many steps in this direction. And so I just want to say that's not true. That's not real. I mean, certainly it can be uncomfortable to scale back, but you're allowed to. Certainly you have not like committed yourself to an eight year contract of friendship with this guy. And if you would like to scale back on how often you see each other outside of work, um, that is fine. And you can and should do that. And then on top of that, I, I, th I think you have my total permission to do whatever you want. Honestly, if you think it's kind of funny and helpful to always play like a slightly coy game with him about it and never tell him. And just if he's like, hey, I, I like saw you like marching at a at trans pride this weekend and you were with eight of your exes who all wore a T-shirt saying like letter writer's name here is my favorite trans person on the planet. <laughs> you could still just be like, I know they're just super supportive, but I'm actually totally cis. Like that's honestly to me, that would be like funny and cute. You could do that. I love that. Keep them guessing. Keep them guessing. Yeah, I think. um that was kind of like where I was at. I was like trying to brainstorm like, okay, like even if this letter writer like pushes the break and it's like, okay, I'm going to set some boundaries here, slow down this friendship. But what if this person still finds out and confronts me about it? Like, what do they do? And again, I was, I was just kind of like on the same page. I was just kind of like, one, you can do whatever you want, but you can also like say like, actually none of your fucking business or like you can do that in a nicer way, but you can literally be like, actually, I don't feel comfortable talking about that right now. I don't see how that's relevant and keep it moving. Yeah. Or you can say stuff like, yeah, it's not a big deal. Or yeah, I keep it personal. Or yeah, when you said you're cis, right? That really freaked me out. Why the hell did you say that? That was a really <laughs> weird thing to say. Don't say that to anyone, even if you definitely think they're cis. Like, and again, you can do that in a way that's not like, and I'm going to haul you up before the trans tribunal. We're all going to scold you. Like, you can let someone know they did something fucked up or like 
just wrongheaded in a way that's still making it clear you f- you find them generally fun to be around and well-meaning. Um, and, and I think that's one of the things that like friendship enables you to do, right? Is like, again, there's ways to do this wrongly or insensitively, but you can affectionately let a friend know like, that was really weird that you did that and you should stop um, without being like, hey, you and I need to talk. You are in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. And I really do appreciate the letter writers. Like, like it sounds like they really have a good sense of, um, I don't owe anybody my status. I don't owe anybody my identity. Is like, and, and I'm just like, you're right. You really don't. So you yeah. can really do whatever you want right now. Yeah. You need to really believe that. Cause like, I think right now you may be like half to 70% believe it, but like, it's really literally true. Even if somebody asks you a direct question, like you can always lie. You know what <laughs> I mean? Like if somebody ever asks you if you're cis and you're trans, you could always say that you're cis. That's a hundred percent going to be okay. Uh, across the board. Any trans person gets to say that. That's so true. Um, yeah. Like you're just allowed to fucking lie. Uh, it's called the closet and it works. <laughs> <laughs> and it's definitely, definitely fine. And uh, yeah, I, I get that it's partly difficult too because somebody like the coworker here is like both well-meaning and kind of, kind of a, an exhausting supporter, you know. And that kind of person is usually the hardest one to give like meaningful feedback to, right? That it's that level of incompetence where you don't know how incompetent you are. Yes. And so it's like, God, if I ever try to like actually explain to him why I didn't tell him at first, then we'd have to have a whole other conversation about all the other ways in which he's just like well-meaning but super clumsy. And then he'll get more clumsy about that. And then he's going to want to check in with me all the goddamn time of like, did I apologize better when I misgendered our coworker this time? And it's like, I don't want that job. No. And then you feel like an asshole too. Like I hate feeling like I'm like policing people, but at the same time, like you, you got to know how to act right. So... And it's not my job to teach you, so. Right, and it'd be different if this was like, this person was coming to you and said like, I want to get better at this. And maybe if you had the kind of friendship where you did feel like, like, it's also not wrong to educate someone if you want to when they ask. Yeah. But this is also like a colleague who kind of sounds like fun, but kind of exhausting. And I've, I think had those friendships before and generally the best way through that is like, we are pretty friendly at work. We occasionally get together outside of work, but I have drawn like, at least for myself, like a certain bright line of like, they're not going to get into my inner circle. And that is for the best. And that is what enables us to have the like pleasant collegial relationships that we do have. And so I think I would encourage you letter writer to feel like this is probably not someone you want to be your best friend. If you do really decide, nope, uh, even all that aside, I really want us to become quite close you are allowed to do that. And at that point, you just have to decide either we can become really close and I don't tell them to do anything differently about how they handle trans issues or asking someone if they're trans or what to do when they misgender someone. Or I bite the bullet, give them a little crash course where I explain a little briskly what they're fucking up and what they need to do better. And then at least once that's out of the way, that's out of the way. But you do have to make that choice. Yeah. But yeah, sorry, I I don't have anything better than that. Like, yeah, that's a that's a reasonable barrier. Like it makes sense to me that this feels like a barrier. I don't have any way like magically through this where I I agree, you're probably not gonna be like besties for like 30 years and then on your deathbed you're like, hey, I really was trans. And they're like, What? I'm shocked. Yeah, people are concerned with our genitals and it's weird. And I'm sorry about that. And people are also sometimes just like bad at like being cool about it. Like, I, you know, so many people would do so much better if they just like, if someone's like, oh, it's actually he or it's actually they or whatever. You use the wrong name. They're just like, oh, sorry about that. Thanks for letting me know. And then moved on as opposed to either, you know, being a little stinker about it or, oh my God, everyone stop so I can freak out about this. Yeah. See, once again, you and I, reasonable, middle <laughs> of the road, always making the right choices never too much of any one thing. Everyone should just join us here on the reasonable path where you never do anything wrong. Wow, wow, wow. They really should. They really should. To be clear, caveat to my listeners, I am aware I do not do everything right, but I did okay today. I agree. I agree. I think um, maybe I was a little harsh on the letter writers, but I don't think I take it back. Yeah. And also, here's the thing. If you were a little harsh, they get to ignore you. That's always the the place where I can, you know, 
let myself off the hook at the end of the day. Like, well, if someone really disagrees, they could turn off this podcast. I can't make them listen to it. That's true. Yeah. So you can't even really hurt them. Sunshine, I think we did great. I think you did great. Thank you so, so much for taking a little time to to talk to us today. Do you have any last words of wisdom for anyone out there? Any general guide to life that you want to try to get on the air in the next uh, minute or two? Ooh, yeah. I honestly, I have to say before coming on here today, I was like, they're probably going to ask me this question and I should probably have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you're like, I should be prepared for like a a guide to life in one minute or less. Right. And then I was like, oh my God, originally I was going to say like, always shoot your shot because that's how I got on the show. And then I was like, wait, somebody already said that and I don't want to copy them. So then I was like, okay. You can say things twice. (laughs) Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Always shoot your shot. If you want to be on a podcast, maybe shoot them a DM. (laughs) Yeah. Anyone can get onto a podcast. It's just some person uh, with a microphone. And um, it is not like getting backstage at the Grammys. That's true. (laughs) Amazing. Thank you so much. I'm also very glad that you shot your shot. And I do hope that we get a chance to have you come back because I think you give great advice. Thank you. Um, Last thing I do want to tell you. um, One time I wrote in and you told me to quit my job. And I quit my job. And it was the best decision I have ever made. Yeah. Oh, (laughs) amazing. It's always the right decision. Yeah, it was awesome. (laughs) Wow. What was the job? Oh, it was, I was the um, nonprofit nonsense letter. (gasps) Sunshine, I think about that letter all the time. That was me. This is amazing. Next time you come back on the show, we're going to read that letter again together (laughs) and talk about all the ways that your life has improved since then. Uh, that's incredible. Yeah. I'm so glad you left that shit job. It was it was crazy. I was like, I cried listening to your letter and I listened to it over and over. And I was like, this is what I need. Like, I, I need to do this right the fuck now. And I did it. You, and I'm so much better now. And I have a great job. I could not feel like all, I'm not wearing buttons, but if I were, they would be busting <laughs> because of how proud I am and how excited I am for you. Thank that you. That just means, the world to me and I'm so so glad because you deserved so much better than that nonsense thank you thank you thank you yeah you knew thanks for joining us on Big Mood Little Mood with me Danny Lavery our producer is Phil Circus, who also composed our theme music don't miss an episode of the show head to slate.com slash mood to sign up, to subscribe, or hit the subscribe button on whatever platform you're using right now. Also, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts if you get a minute. We'd love to know what you think. If you want more Big Mood, Little Mood, you should join Slate Plus, Slate's membership program. Members get an extra episode of Big Mood, Little Mood every Friday, and you'll get to hear more advice and conversations and interview questions with our guests. And as a Slate Plus member, you'll also be supporting the show. Go to slate.com forward slash mood plus to sign up. If you need some little advice or big advice and you'd like me to read your letter on the show, head to slate.com slash mood to find our big mood, little mood listener question form or find a link in the description of the platform you're using right now. Thanks for listening. And here's a preview of our Slate Plus episode coming this Friday. I don't want anyone to feel like Imposter syndrome is this, it's like verified by the scientific method. We all know exactly what it's like. If you have it, it's a problem that needs to be treated and ideally cured. Like, it's no more real than any other attempt to kind of try to figure out how do you live in a world where you know your own internal feelings and you have to guess what other people are feeling based on what they say and do. To listen to the rest of that conversation, join Slate Plus now at slate.com forward slash mood. Join Macy's on their mission to tackle barriers to education. Since 2021, they've partnered with UNCF to provide scholarships to nearly 300 students at historically black colleges and universities. Help Macy's and UNCF continue their impact by rounding up your purchase in-store or donating online this month to help fund scholarships for HBCU students. Learn more at macy's.com slash purpose. Hey everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts 
DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe now.